Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session. Catalina, are you on? I don't quite know. It looks like maybe you might be frozen, but Catalina will be our moderator today if her internet is working all right. I'm not quite sure. All right, maybe not. So uh, hi, everyone. I'll jump in real quick. So my name is Victoria Vixney. Um, I'm one of the trainers at the California Student Aid Commission. But look at your videos. Are you there, Catalina? All right, looks like we've got some technical Zoom issues. No worries, that's why. Um, we have CSAC tech support here. I'm, I'm here. Awesome, thank you, Catalina. Feel free to jump in. All right, thank you. I have my camera on, but I don't see. You're good. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to the Mythbusters, debunking college and financial aid misconceptions and leveraging proactive financial aid resources session. And thank you for choosing this session to learn more about financial aid resources to prepare families and students early in their journey to post-secondary education. I hope you have all had had the opportunity to listen into the stories, the experiences, learn lessons from students, experts, part and partners to learn from them and think about what you can do to make changes, to streamline processes, to change policies, to best serve students who need your help to be successful. It only takes one inaccurate or discouraging message to a parent or a student and that ends their dream of a post-secondary education and ultimately a great future career. My name is Catalina Missler, and I'm the Chief Deputy Director here of the Student Aid Commission, also known as CSAC. I've been with CSAC for many, many, many years, and I've chosen to make this my career because of the mission to promote educational equity by making post-secondary education affordable for all Californians, and the vision to transform lives by creating educational opportunities for the state's diverse population, driving its social and economic well-being to ensure a promising future for all. This is why I continue to do this work because of how critical financial aid is for students to pursue their education beyond high school and to land a great job and change their lives. I still hear it today from students and their parents that they cannot pay for college because it's too expensive, but it's because they don't have the correct information. They don't have all of the information and they need us to help them understand so that they can believe that there are those resources and that they do qualify if they take that step to apply. So today this breakout session connects with the summit theme of leading student-centered financial aid, best practices and partnerships. Partnerships is a must in order for us to get the information out to educate families and students and encourage them to believe that their children can afford to go to college. I'm so grateful to our partners who will share their program information with you today so you can learn about how families can start early to think about college and how the college costs can be covered by these resources. It's not a myth. This workshop provides you with the strategies to engage students from low-income backgrounds and to debunk common myths about financial aid that prevents students and families from completing the process and for them to explore ways students and families can get a head start with their college savings. With that, let me introduce our MythBuster team to share the work of their organizations and the financial aid programs they administer. We have Hugo Ke, who is the director of College Access Marin and Contra Costas, who's with 10,000 Degrees. We have Dana Salas, outreach specialist with the Scholar Share Investment Board, the California State Treasurer's Office. And we have Lori Marvin, who's the director of recruitment for California Volunteers Office of the Governor. Then let them start with sharing that information and the important the importance of starting early and the programs that they'll share with you today. Before we get started, have a question, use the Q&A. Fill out the attendance form to receive the take home materials and look for this icon.
The goals for today, you will learn CalKids program, the benefits and opportunities for students and families. 10,000 degrees will be preparing our partners for financial aid success. College Core will gain skills, help others, earn money for college and more. And then the opportunity for questions and all resources. Dana. Thank you, Catalina. So to start off, we'll be talking about the CalKids program. So many of you may be familiar with this program already, but it's always good to share the information because it's such a great resource. Uh, it's free money for college. And to be, uh, to be sure, the studies that are out there show that students with at least $500 designated in the savings account for college are three times more likely to graduate high school and pursue higher education. So with that, next slide. So the CalKids program saw this need that there was supposed, that there's supposed to be some money set aside for students so that they could save for college. So the CalKids program was created by the California State Treasurer's Office, which is overseen by the Scholar Share Investment Board. So that's where I work. And it is a state program, CalKids is a state program that helps children save for college or career training after high school. So just to let you know, it is a state program. So many families, you can assure them that it's a real program because we do send notification letters to let families know that they're eligible, but sometimes they may be skeptical, but let them know that it is a real program. Next. So. There are two groups that are eligible for CalKids. Today, we'll be focusing on the low to moderate income students as you all work with students, but there is the other group, California newborns, and they might still be a relevant group because those students may have siblings um, and you know family members, things like that. So it's always good to know, but there are two groups, so you know. All California newborns that have been born after July 1st of 2022, so regardless of income, they get a CalKids account. It's up to $175 that they would get as a seed start deposit. Um, so it is something to get them started and their family started. So the low to moderate income students is the other group that gets an account. They get a little bit extra money, a little bit more, which we'll learn about in the following slides. Next. So we're going to dive deep into the Student CalKids Award because you all here are working with students, helping them navigate a financial aid. So this is the great, a great resource that you could share with them in helping them pay for college. So next. So we're going to deep dive into the eligibility for low to moderate income students. So basically, it does rely on the local control funding formula. So if those students are eligible for this and they are certified, then they would most likely be eligible for the CalKids program. So the LCFF, I'm sure you are familiar with this, but they do have to be certified because I know many schools offer free reduced lunch regardless of income to all students, but to be eligible for CalKids because we do partner with the California Department of Education, um, to be eligible, they would have to be at least um, included with this LCFF eligibility. So it could be free and reduced lunch, maybe English learner, maybe their family submitted other forms like house alternative household income form, CalFresh, CalWork, some of these things uh, may help eligibility as well. So there is an award that is given to students that are homeless and foster students as well. So this would all fall into the same thing. Now, like I mentioned, we do partner with the California Department of Education to give us student information. So we don't have an income scale or anything like that. It's just based on what the CDE provides to us. And once we know who's eligible, CalKids automatically creates an account for eligible students once we get that data from CDE. So that's how eligibility would work. Next. So a little bit more about the eligibility for students. So CalKids launched in September, well, in 2022. So this first year that CalKids awarded students was from the academic year 21-22. So it was about 3.4 million students that got this CalKids award if they were eligible. And it was all eligible first to 12th grade public school students. So it's a large amount, many students throughout California. 
in many counties, well, all counties throughout California. So just so you know, because many of those students that perhaps graduated in class of 22, class of 23, class of 24, maybe they already are in college. If you still keep up with them, if you follow them throughout um, their college career, let them know that they may be eligible for CalKids because their CalKids award, if they were eligible back then, it would still be active. But currently, the students you work with now, they may still be eligible as well because that first year, it captured students from first to 12th grade. So they're still going to be in school throughout the years. Now, just to break it down a little bit, now every year moving forward after that initial year, only eligible first graders are awarded a CalKids award. So I hope this doesn't confuse many of you because I know it's a lot of numbers and dates, um, but if you would like to learn more about this, the CalKids website has a lot of great resources if you want to break it down and kind of read about it, see, so kind of understand it really well, it really helps. But this is just an overview of how the breakdown works. But for the most part, it is just a one-time award, so they would have only gotten it once, and it's theirs to keep until um, we'll get into when they can uh, use it and everything, but until the age of 26, so I'm just a little ahead of myself there, but that's when they can stop using it at age of 26. So they have a long time. So next slide. So to determine eligibility, like I mentioned before, we do send notification letters to families letting them know that they are eligible. So sometimes these may get lost in the mail or maybe they are misplaced. So students, families may not have it. So to give them an alternative way to determine eligibility, we do have our website, calkids.org. On there is an eligibility tool. So this is just kind of an overview, little picture of what the website looks like. Um, but if you scroll down, you will see that blue box that says, are you eligible? And then it has a pop-up that students can follow the questions and determine if they're eligible or not. For other it's like educators, people that work with students, things like that. We have a partner tab. On that partner tab, we do have an eligibility tool link that just directs you to that specific link. So you don't have to answer any of these questions. You just need to enter the student's SSID, the statewide student identifier. And once you enter that 10 digit code, it'll say, congratulations, you're eligible, or I'll say, unfortunately, you're not found in the system. So it's either of those two things that will happen uh, once they enter their SSID to determine eligibility, those two things, either yes or no. If they are eligible, it will direct them to the claim page where they can start to claim their award. And um, the CalKids website definitely has a lot of great resources. And towards the end of my share of this presentation, we have a toolkit for you all. That way you could um, get these resources directly. So uh, stay tuned for that in just a few slides. Next slide. So this is the award amount that the students would get if they are eligible. So $500 initially, that's what everyone who's eligible would get. Now, if a student was also identified as a foster youth or unhoused, they would get additional funds. So at least $500 if they're foster youth and at least 500 more if they're unhoused. So some students may have 1,000, some students may have up to $1,500, depending on what their situation was, um, but it depends what happens there, but $500 initially. It is just a one-time award, like I mentioned, and just to note, it is put into a savings account that does generate a little bit of interest. So through the years, it is garnering a little bit of interest and it can be more than $500, but it will never drop below 500 because it is placed into a very conservative account. But just so you know, it is growing a little bit. So if you do help students claim their awards, you will see that it might be 560, some may have 600 already. So the, the amounts may vary a little bit, but the initials is $500 that they would get for school. Next slide. So what can they use their CalKids award for? So it will be, they can use it for tuition and fees, books and supplies, computer equipment, that sort of stuff. So they do wanna check, they should check with their financial aid office where they will be attending in the future. Uh, once they are there, they can check with them to make sure um, everything is good to go on the scholarship office. 
Um, but it is treated as a scholarship, so it won't affect financial aid. It won't affect income or taxes. It's not reported like that because we do not require tax ID numbers. It's just a scholarship that's sent directly to the institution where they will attend, and the institution then will distribute it however the school distributes financial aid. Now, students may talk to the financial aid office and request that their CalKids expense, their check be used for books or supplies. They can make that request, but just check with the financial aid office just to make sure. But to let you know, it is just like a scholarship. Next. So in order to request a distribution, so a student does have to be at least 17 years of age, and they do have until the age of 26 to use all their funds. So if at first, maybe they haven't heard of it yet, but they are 20 already, they it's still okay. It's not too late because they have until the age of 26 to use all their funds. And of course, even now this is current seniors, current juniors, um, they could still claim their funds if they were eligible at the first go round. They could check eligibility to determine that and they would have until the age of 26. Now they could use these funds at schools that participate with the FAFSA. So you all are very familiar with the FAFSA, um, but it could be schools that are um, technical schools, trade schools, um, so community colleges, private schools, it could be in-state, out-of-state, and even out of the country, so as long as they work with FAFSA. Now we do encourage students to check eligibility because if they're eligible, they get to claim their account and to claim their account, um, that's where they would request their distributions from their portal, their profile. So when they claim their account, they're basically creating a username and password to log in to their specific, their personal CalKids account. There they will see their balance and they will be able to request a distribution from there only. So that's why it's important for them to to make sure they get this resource because that's the only way for them to get the money out. Now they can use all of their funds at once or maybe they only need $100 for something or they can use the rest later. So they don't have to use it all right away. Um, and it, again, it is treated as a scholarship. So in a nutshell, that's pretty much what the CalKids program is, um, who it's for, how much, how you could use it. Um, so it's a really great resource to share with students because it's, you know, no, no essays required. It's just a scholarship automatic that's from the state of California that they could start using as soon as they're 17, as long as they have college costs or education costs, and it's there for them. So next slide. So as educators and those that work with students, so there's ways that you could help to share this information that we'd love to work with you. So please feel free to incorporate CalKids into your programming. We do have our CalKids online toolkit that has flyers, digital content, social media things that you may, images that you may want to use, videos. So it's a lot of information on there that you can share as resources with everyone. So incorporate it in um, your lessons or your offices have the flyers there. Uh, we also work with many uh, school districts uh, throughout the state in providing presentations, something like, something like this. Um, to families and students. So we would be more than happy to provide a webinar like this, a presentation for your students. Um, we are based in Sacramento and we do travel sometimes. So if you do require an in-person presentation, feel free to work with us. Um, but virtual is great as well. Now, if you know of other schools and community organizations that you work with, let them know about the program. And if you think that we could be a good partner with them, let us know. We would love to work with more um, families and students. So I hope that this information was useful. Um, next slide. <laughs> so next slide, yes, that, that one. And so here is, um, you can get my email address if you would like to um, partner up and we could provide a presentation for your families and your students that you work with and you can get the QR code here to get the partner toolkit that I was talking about that has a lot of good resources for you to use to share the information. But I really appreciate you uh, learning more about the CalKids program and I'm gonna hand it off to Uva. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Dana, for that. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Ugo K. I'm the 10,000 degrees college access 
um, Program Director for Marin and Contra Costa Counties. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with you all today because we are here to talk about not just about what 10,000 Degrees does in general, but really to talk about how we partner with our organizations as well as high schools and hopefully you all get to take some of those best practices with you. So for those who have not had the chance to get to know 10,000 Degrees, I'll go real quickly here. Uh, we are a nonprofit college access and success nonprofit organization. Our main goal is to support our students farthest from opportunity get to and through college. We are currently in eight Bay Area counties and we do support students in Utah through the Utah Jazz Scholarship. So a lot of people are always surprised about that, but yes, we are over there as well. A few things that we are really passionate about is that we believe that all students, regardless of where they're coming from, their backgrounds, if they want to go to college, they can, right? So our goal is to ensure that they have their options, they know what's out there, and get excited for that next momentum after high school, and also encourage them while they are in college, which we all know it's sometimes a very scary place to be, especially being first generation. I'm excited to share that I myself a, am an alumni of 10,000 Degrees. I was one of those students many years ago, and I get excited even more when I share that with other students who are also worried about the process, but I let them know that it's okay. A few pieces that we work with students on, you can see it on the screen, but it really is navigating that college applications, navigating financial aid applications, but also having a clear understanding of what those options look like for them. And as I mentioned, and we'll keep repeating, getting them and their families excited for that next step. So our focus for today, a little bit myth busting, and you're welcome to use the chat if you like, but I'm curious, to all of you, if in the first myth that we have, we should be talking about financial aid once financial aid applications open. What do you all think? Feel free to put in the chat or you can also answer out loud. All right, we see some responses coming in. Yes, false. So for us, it should definitely be a conversation that happens way before, right? So one of our best practices that we uh, work with our partners is to start the conversations early. You know, this means a lot of different things for different school partners, depending on resources and also just awareness about the financial aid system and process. But one of the things that we want to encourage all of our school partners is to start thinking about the financial aid season before December, right? Or before October, whenever the applications open. A practice that we have done at the end of each year, we have a meeting with our school partners and we start talking about dates. We start talking about data. We start talking about what they wanna see once financial aid season comes in. So what part of that conversation also includes who's gonna be, be part of your financial aid team on your school campus. We understand that counselors have a lot on the plate and we encourage that this shouldn't just fall on them. Who else is part of that conversation? Maybe a college and career uh, advisor or counselor. Uh, it could also be an administrator. It could also be part of the AVID team, right? A variety of team um, players who can help move the needle in that space. Part of it is also setting some goals for ourselves. One of the things that we're really proud of at 10,000 Degrees is to do practices via our data. What is the data showing? And what do we need to be pivoting? So the other pieces around starting the conversation early is identifying, are our staff trained? Do they know the basics of financial aid? Who will be that expert on campus? Who will be there just to support with uh, other questions that come up? It's important to have that and share those resources with them and ongoing conversations about those trainings. One of the things that I like that, I, that some of our partners here in Marin County did is started to create a plan A and a plan B of potential dates for workshops. We had one school in particular at the end of May, they already had dates for us for this fall and spring semester. That really helps us as a partner, a CBO, to not only prep for our potential staffing, but also be aware of what's coming up and, and get ready to hear from our families and students about the best way we can encourage those uh, encourage them to attend. And a pro tip that we heard is that we want to include our high school coaches, right? They're part of the conversation. 
you know, many of them are excited for their student athletes for that next step to go into college, become a college athlete. And so having them be part of the conversation was very exciting. And so let me share with you all a few of our tools that we have shared, you know, financial aid campaign document. It's a short, maybe two or three pages, um, but it's really to help create a game plan of all our stakeholders in there. We provide ideas of how many workshops you wanna be having for the school, depending on logistics and staffing. We also talk about who are some of our low hanging fruit. And you're gonna hear me say that again in a bit, but we talk about our data. By what date do we wanna have X percentage of our students completing financial aid application? It really helps us figure out what's gonna be best for the students, but also for our school partners, navigate the resources and plan accordingly, right? We also created a special um, calendar for, from our end just to help us plan the events that are coming up for the spring semester. And so we do have these resources. We'll share more and we'll share the link um, at the end. So don't worry, they will be sent over to you. But of course, I wanna highlight all of the different workshops and events and training materials, not only by 10,000 degrees, but also our partners like CSAC. So, as we talk about preparing for the spring semester, we also wanna highlight that you are not alone in this process. Some of you have worked really closely with 10,000 degrees and we thank you for that partnership. And some of you are saying, Ugo, we don't have a lot of partners in our community or maybe we don't know who's out there, right? So this is the perfect time to start thinking about who is in our community working with college access readiness, who may be part of the conversation to help us move the needle with financial aid. So one of those items that we talk about is inviting key players from your community. You know, one of the uh, items that Dana talked about with Cal Kids, it's inviting them to share information to your students and community. That is actually something that we are doing here in Marin, inviting our partner who is the lead in Cal Kids to not only help share information, but get students excited of additional funds that might be available to them, right? And sometimes they bring their kid, their sorry, their siblings or parents bring, you know, their neighbors, so on and so forth, and they find out more about these opportunities. Another item that we think about is our universities and colleges that are local, reaching out to the financial aid office, maybe talk to a director or, or director of student outreach, you know, talk to them to see, do you have staff for the events coming up? And we will love to partner. One of the items that we wanna highlight here around preparing our school and our community is thinking outside of the box. You're gonna hear, or probably you already heard a lot of great practices. We encourage you to take those and make them your own, but also ask your students, right? What helps them get excited for these items? What kind of imagery do they wanna see in the posters? What kind of language or events do they wanna see? Right? You'll be surprised to hear the different options. And it always feels good when it's exactly what you might be thinking of. But it's just as good when you hear, oh, I never thought about that will be a way a student will want to engage. So think about those components. Think about different avenues to encourage and share information with financial aid. And as I mentioned, our low hanging fruit. Who are the students that we want to target and connect with sooner than later? All right, so here's some resources that we have put together. This is a letter that we have created for some of our high schools that choose to use it. We did hear feedback from some students and families that they say, as much as we love all the emails that come in through Parent Square or other avenues, it sometimes is a lot. So sometimes sending a letter is a lot more helpful. So we did create a tool that they can use if they like, not only showing information and dates, but also why they should be applying as well as some FAQs for them to get ready. And of course, a template. So this template that you see on the right is a template from one of our high schools in North Marin they put together. Their whole counseling department comes together in the spring semester for two different events and they just call all the seniors out and they check, did you attend this event? Have you accomplished your financial aid? Are, where are you? Do you not want to do financial aid? And based on those conversations, they go to different tables to learn more or to get them to the finish line. I know I say that example and some of you are saying, whoa, that's a lot. We have a large school or, hey, we don't have that capacity. And that's OK. It's about thinking outside of the box and talking to your financial aid team on campus of what can we do now that we're here? All right. So 
here is another piece that we want to talk about. The apps are open. That's exciting, but also can be very scary. What do we do, right? So a couple of components in the way that we like to think about it is we want to measure our goals. We want to celebrate our wins and we want to innovate. So the first way to do that is definitely, you know, this semester, we're going to see some movement, potentially not a lot in the first couple of weeks, right? But we want to review our data. Did we get X amount of students applied? Did we get the students that we wanted to get started with, you know, halfway there? So we want to ensure that our students and our partners are seeing the data. So we are moving the needle. And if we need to innovate, let's make sure that we do that as spring semester comes around the corner. Our second bullet point here is reminders, reminders, and more reminders. You all know this very well, but we want to make sure the messaging is not just about, hey, did you complete your financial aid application? You have to do it. It's more about, are you keeping your options open? Are you excited for what that's going to look like after high school? And if you don't know, that's okay. Don't forget that we're here and there are these events coming up. And one of the best parts about collaborating with other CBOs and co collaborating with our school staff, as well as universities and colleges, is that when a student sees a variety of team members and advocates, they get more excited. Sometimes they don't, they see me one time and never see me again, but they see somebody else from another CBO that they connect with ongoing. So there's a little more trust, right? So we wanna make sure that we have those opportunities and we're thinking about the different um, mediums that we want to present information. Maybe virtual works best. Maybe it's in person. Maybe it's a Saturday event. So we want to keep those options open. And of course, reviewing training materials. You all are here because you're getting ready for financial aid, and I'm sure you all have gone through so many different financial aid circumstances, some special scenarios. It's important to share those with other people, right? Your colleagues, and talk about, hey, this I ran into this this week or last week or something happened with a student or family. Talk about that. You may not have all the answers at the time, but it's good to keep that uh, awareness because that helps us inform our better practices for the next season or maybe even the next event. So here are some of the resources. One of the things that we love talking about is data, of course. So one of the things that some school sites are using is an RSVP form for events. You know, we want to make sure that our resources are used as best as we can. And it feels a little down when you only get a small handful of students when you are expecting a large um, group of students. So some partners are using that to kind of pivot and see how the movement's looking like for that specific event, sharing those dates specifically in advance, and of course, checking our different data tools. The dashboard is there, um, as well as you know the CSAC reports that your, our counselors get. Download those, share those in an all staff meeting, you know, share the success along the way. All right, so now that we are done with financial aid season, sometimes that's what people say, right? March 2nd, March 3rd comes around the corner and people are like, all right, we're moving on to the next thing. Yes, and is what we like to say. For us, the deadline is just one of many measurable goals, right? At what percentage did we get our seniors to that finish line? Was that the goals that we wanted to have? If it is, awesome, celebrate that. If it's not, okay, what do we need to be doing to change that narrative? So for us, it's all about the culture, the financial aid culture that we have in our school sites. And I wanna note, I'm using financial aid, not only FAFSA, right? Because some of our students are eligible for the California Dream Act. Some students are not eligible for either, but could be eligible for other financial aid opportunities, right? Scholarships, so on and so forth. So language is part of that culture that we want to cultivate with our school community. So of course, keeping the financial aid conversation going. Students may think about college at different times of their journey. So with 10,000 degrees, it's not a finished conversation after March 3rd. We're including it in all different conversations, especially when students finally say, hey, I heard about financial aid. Am I too late? Internally, you'd be like, depending on the situation, but let's get you um, started. It's that excitement to get them to the next finish line, right? And we heard al already from Dana, the CalKids program, there's a financial aid component there, that's that scholarship, right? And we're gonna be able to hear a little bit more down the line, 
but we want to make sure that our students are thinking about financial aid in a variety of ways throughout their education journey. Our second bullet point here is celebration, right? We wanna celebrate no matter where we were, no matter where we ended, we understand the financial aid process and the systems, sometimes out of our control, but the little wins go a long way. So make sure you celebrate yourselves and also we're preparing for the next cycle, right? And our third bullet point, which is something that's really special to us, is Im implement the financial aid conversation throughout the earlier grades. This is a big piece of feedback that we hear from students and families and some of our school partners is that we're hearing about financial aid until the senior year, right? Where students should be talking about financial aid way earlier. So once they're in senior year, they're a little bit more prepared or there's more awareness. So a few examples of that is preparing families for those big uh, asks, those requests on special documents. Have those conversations during your A through G conversations, during the back to school nights on the first day on campus. It's sometimes information overload, but it's important for that repetition, right? One of the things that we do in one of in our Aberia counties uh, is our 10,000 degrees Money Matters, Budgeting for College Experience. It's a simulation for our students to get excited for financial aid. Usually this is for our juniors and our sophomores. Um, so they know how to read an award letter. And once they're seniors, they know what that looks like. So here are some examples of those uh, activities that we do with our school partners. They are offerings that we do. And so if you are interested, you're always welcome to reach out for those opportunities. So, I said a lot, a lot of information was shared here. I get really excited about this space. And so I wanted to finish with these notes here. You know, keep an eye and an ear for how are students and your communities navigating the financial aid conversation, right? Keeping in mind, if we need to have private spaces ready during a large workshop or a large classroom event, right? We wanna make sure that we are also encouraging not only normalizing the conversation of FAFSA and California Dream Act, but also being mindful of when a student or family may want their own space, right? One of the things that it does hurt me when I hear or see in practice, um, other volunteers go into a workspace and start calling students out and asking them, hey, are you undocumented? Hey, do you know what, what you're eligible for? And, and that's not a great practice, right? So we wanna be mindful of those pieces and we keep our families together and actually get them excited for whatever application they're thinking about. And one of the things that we like to do is not separating the family, especially when it's just informational. We want them to have autonomy and let them practice and go to where they need to go, whether that's the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application, right? So we definitely talk about both applications in our engagements. We get them excited for it, regardless of what they wanna do. And if they have questions, that's why we and your financial aid teams are there to support them. So again, we went over so much while we we'll sharing the slides, but I did wanna highlight a couple pieces. Start talking and planning on your data. How do you wanna track your students? And this shouldn't fall only on our counselors. I'm shouting you out counselors, because I know sometimes they look at you and you're the expert and you're like, I have 400 students that I have to think about plus the other 9, 10, 11th grade students, right? So think about those components and how you're gonna be leveraging your team. But of course, if anything else, talking about financial aid early from 9th to 11th grade and celebrate all those little items there. So to finish up the, my last few points here, we do have a scholarship, uh, 10,000 degree scholarships currently open. The priority deadline is March 3rd. Our eligible students are those in our A barrier counties and partner schools, but we encourage all students to apply uh, because one never knows, right? A uh, very special thing about our program as well as our scholarship, there's no GPA requirements, there's no citizenship or documentation status requirements. We just encourage students to get excited and, and look for the opportunities that are out there for them. So if you have curiosities or questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, and we're excited to share more information with you on those notes. Um, but financial aid and our best practices doesn't only end on today's event. It's an ongoing conversation. So we are inviting you, our educators, to connect with us through our Train to Trainer events. These are free virtual um, spaces where you get to learn more from our fellows and more from our, our partners around how do we navigate financial aid conversations, right? We have two coming up on November 13th and November 14th, but we will also have events 
best practices supporting our undocumented students, our foster youth, and our Black and African American students. So that information is going to be on our website. We encourage you to connect with us. And of course, if you're interested to learn more about our newsletter, we do share information on a quarterly basis about what's going on. So thank you for being here with us today. And I will pass the mic over to our California Volunteers team. Thank you so much, Hugo. Um, and thank you all for staying engaged. I do see a lot of questions coming in that Q&A box, so keep them coming. Uh, we do our best to try to answer them. Um, you know, as soon as we can get to them, uh, we will have time for Q&A as soon as I am done here. So we'll jump into it. Um, my name is Lori Marvin. Again, I am the Director of Recruitment and Outreach with California Volunteers and the Office of the Governor. Um, and California Volunteers is the largest state service commission in our country. We partner with organizations across California to connect our folks with service, volunteerism, and civic action to tackle our state's greatest challenges together. And this year, we're recruiting 10,000 members to get paid to serve their community through programs such as Californians for All College Corps, which is what we'll be going over today. So, um, College Corps is a partnership between California volunteers and over 40 colleges and universities across the state where full-time undergraduate students are getting paid to gain skills and help others. College Corps partner campuses include public and private four-year institutions and community colleges across the state. Um, and College Corps is a priority for our governor and the legislature and the biggest investment in a college service program in the state's history. Um, this program aims to create a generation of civic-minded leaders who will bridge divides to solve problems, help students graduate on time and with less debt, and address societal challenges and help build more equitable communities across California. And College Corps focuses on three key areas. So our fellows uh, lead projects in K through 12 education programs, for example, such as running extracurricular and after school programs, supporting students in the classrooms and empowering students as a tutor or a mentor. Um, they also engage in climate action projects with community based organizations um, to serve in areas like urban greening or recycling projects or tree planting or composting so much more. And they also lead projects to address food insecurity. Um, examples there could look like, you know, our, our fellows um, supporting their fellow college students in resource uh, centers on campus to connect students with housing and food resources, or maybe they're leading food distribution projects at local food banks and more. It really runs the gamut um, across the 40 plus campuses that are partner um, colleges and universities with College Core. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, there are so many immediate and long-term benefits for this service program, both for the students who serve and for the communities they reach. Um, before I dive into those, I do wanna highlight one of the elements that makes this program so unique uh, is that it is um, open to AB 540 eligible students to participate. Um, it's the first ever uh, paid state uh, paid service program that welcomes um, undocumented students. So that's that's exciting. Um, now, like I said, there's many benefits associated with the program. The fellows receive a living allowance during their service, um, which spans across one academic year. Students complete 450 hours of service across a year. Um, and at the end, they receive an education award upon completing the program. And all of that totals about $10,000. Um, but it goes beyond that uh, financial benefit. Our, our students in this program gain unique experiences while building meaningful connections. They're working with community-based organizations. They're gaining leadership skills, project management skills, uh, you know, communication skills, time management. I mean, it just goes on and on. But what I love about paid service programs that's unique from other work opportunities is that you really get exposed to folks that you aren't likely to get exposed to at this stage in a career um, as an intern or in another job. So you are working with leaders in the community um, and you're working alongside other really passionate and driven students. Um, so you build a cohort of colleagues that support you throughout your career. Um, 
also there's additional benefits that vary from campus to campus. In some cases, students are earning academic credit for their hands-on experience that they're gaining. Um, some campuses offer transportation vouchers or passes, um, and <clears throat> others uh, have other wraparound services. So it really does vary. But no matter what, these, these fellows, these students, um, are really well supported by the College Corps campus staff there. Um, and they receive ongoing check-ins and tutor, or uh, I'm sorry, not tutoring, <laughs> mentoring, um, and connection to other resources that they might need. Next slide, please. I just want to do a couple of, uh, just to give you, some paint, put some faces to this experience. I'll give you a couple of examples and, and give some shout outs here to a few of our fellows. This is Wendy Lazola. Wendy is um, one of the earlier College Corps fellows. This program is young. We're only in our third year of College Corps right now. Um, we've already seen great impacts and Wendy speaks to that. Um, she loved her experience and has certainly become an advocate for this program. And, and Wendy shared that as an AB 540 California Dream Act student, joining College Corps was the best decision I made for my education and career preparation. I could cover my educational expenses, gain work experience, and make a difference in my community. Students will no longer feel limited due to their background, and college students should definitely apply to the program today. Um, another shout out for Wendy is that she really became passionate and involved um, to advocate for this program the uh, ex uh, expansion of the program. And she actually now is serving in a governor appointed role as a member of our California State uh, Service Commission, which is a big deal. So go Wendy. Next slide, please. Another shout out before we move on to Heidi Diaz. Heidi uh, served as a, a College Corps fellow twice, back to back terms in Yolo County. Um, uh, Heidi, stood out to me because I love to hear how her service experience helped like solidify what she wanted to do with her career. Um, she started out at community college and joined College Corps as a community college student. Um, and her service took her to a, a basic resource center on campus where she connected fellow students with resources. And she talked a lot about how rewarding it was to be able to be in a role, like to feel empowered and connected to provide opportunities and resources for fellow students um, and how she was able to help folks feel comfortable asking for help that they needed. Um, and she also talked about her uh, experience getting to know her site supervisor, um, the person at the Basic Resource Center who really guided her efforts. Um, she shared that her site supervisor took the time to walk her through his career in public health, um, and it helped her realize that basic needs is a central, uh, basic necessities is a central need for supporting public health. Um, and after finishing her two service terms with College Corps, Heidi is now wrapping up her degree in public health and has transferred to a four-year institution. So another success story. We'll move on, and I can share a little bit about... The next slide, um, just give you a snapshot of community impact. Like I said, this is a young program. Uh, we're just uh, in our third year and we're already seeing huge impacts. And this is one small example. In just one six month period last school year, College Corps fellows mentored and tutored over 28,000 students across the state. They planted more than 700 trees contributing to the greening of our communities, and they contributed to the distribution of over 47 million pounds of food. And that's just one six month period. Um, and all of that effort amounts to over a million hours of service, and that's growing and it's grown significantly since and will continue. Um, so just one snapshot of how the community feels the impacts of this um, of this service. Next slide, please. So a term of service starts at the beginning of the fall semester or quarter, um, but applications open in the spring. So to serve as a fellow, say for example, you've got some students starting college next year, um, and they want to utilize this opportunity to gain skills, help others, and earn money for school. Uh, well, they'd want, as soon as they decide what college they may attend, or if they're not quite sure what their options are, take a look at our website to see which campuses participate in College Corps um, so that it's another you know tool in their toolbox to help pay for school and gain skills. 
Um, so they can check the our website. Um, and when they apply, so applications will open in the spring. Um, typically, they open at the beginning of March. Um, that date hasn't been announced yet, but it'll be about mid, mid spring semester. Then uh, as soon as they know where they want to go to school, they can apply. They don't have to have been accepted to the school yet or, uh, you know, begun enrollment. Um, the campus that they're interested in attending, the college course staff there can answer questions they, that they might have. So it's never too early to learn more. So visit, visit the College Corps website. I'll put it in the uh, chat here for you all. To see the list of participating college campuses, you can also submit an interest form so that, that you get notified when applications open in the spring. And for those of you that might be interested in having a College Corps presentation for your staff or your students, um, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, our contact information will be shared along with the other resources uh, of this presentation, but I'll put my email address in the chat as well. Um, the website is spelled out here under the QR code for folks that don't, that are you know, uh, able to scan that code right now, but I will put it in the chat as promised. And, I think that wraps it up for me. Thank you, Laurie. So we have, yeah. can you hear me? Hope I'm on, okay. Um, so the key things we've heard, and I hope that you all had um, identified what those key things are. And at least from what we heard was that starting early um, and not waiting until it's too late. Doesn't We know that it happens all the time when families realize that they can't come up with what is expected and trying to figure out the senior year becomes very difficult and frustrating. And that's when these students lose out, especially when they don't have the family support to help them to take the steps of applying and figuring out how it all comes together for them. As Hugo said, you're not alone. As counselors, administrators, community leaders, teachers, um, coaches, uh, PE teachers, everyone is, is available to help. And I know for our Cash for College programs, we reach out to everyone. We have train the trainer programs to provide those training to volunteers who want to help or even just learn about this information. So again, you're not alone. That's why we are here to help support. And as you heard with all of these programs here, offering Dana included, Dana offered to reach out to her to provide webinars and get resources. So you have that kind of assistance and support in, in being able to learn about these programs and also to provide this, this to, the, to, to families. Um, and Hugo, I love when you say that, you know, think outside of the box. Again, if we keep doing the same thing and keep producing the same outcomes, then you're working harder, not smarter. It's really take this, take best practices, learn about them, call others, call organiz other organizations um, that can offer you the resources and support. Call CSAT to help you organize Cash for College workshops. So there's a lot of resources we learned today, a lot of resources and a lot of willing folks here that are that are here to help and here to provide information and, and tools that you need to to help families and students figure out this, figure out the main important thing of being able to afford to go to college. Otherwise they don't have this piece, they're not going. So I think with that, um, I know that I thought I had, I thought there was a, a, a hand up. I don't know if we wanna take some of the questions. I think I think uh, Lori and um, Dana and Hugo have been answering the questions in the, the Q and A. Um, but if there's anything, I think we do have a little time to, um, take any additional questions that may not have been answered in the in the Q&A. Dana, Lori, or uh, Hugo, are there any questions that you want to bring up and explain more if there wasn't enough opportunity to respond in the Q&A? Oh, Catalina, yeah. we yeah. have a raised hand from Lori Carrillo. Not sure if that's been up or not. Uh, 
Oh, she said, sorry. So I think maybe that hit the wrong button. That's okay, Laurie. Uh, Jim Lundgren has a raised hand. Oh, is that another wrong button? No. So we can we get to unmute them to get to ask, ask their question? Just wanted to make sure you mentioned prior, prior year. That's why we start early. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, why don't we go back and just um, then from the, the panels, uh, Dana, I see you on, um, just maybe one last minute uh, tip from your program we can provide as there as we've given them information. And at this point we say that there really are no excuses because they've heard here today how many resources are available. And there's many families that are waiting to hear that they can consider sending their children to college, even if it looks unattainable today. But when they hear that they can start now and how much is available, that what they can tell their children is that they are going to college. So Dana, any, any last minute uh, tip? <laughs> I would just encourage everyone, if you don't think you are eligible anyway, just check eligibility for CalKids because you may be eligible for the students. Um, and I would just say that, just check eligibility if uh, yes or no. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. And Hugo, you had a lot of great tips there. I took away a lot from the starting early and you're not alone and, 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 to just to continue to build their programs with the support that they have from others. So any one, one um, more tip that you can offer? Oh, we, we have so many tips, but I'll be mindful of time and, and where we're at here. Uh, but I will say, you know, sometimes every year because of challenges, technical challenges or what are the systems, whatever that may be, it could feel very daunting and, and know that you can reach out to your colleagues across the state um, to learn more on how do you navigate. Uh, sometimes as financial aid experts, it, it really is unfortunate when we have to tell a student like, oh, I don't know that answer yet because it's something that's new. But the best part is when you learn together, right? Learn together with a student, learn together with a family member at, at the event, and they see you as that advocating person, somebody that they can trust, that goes a long way. So we definitely encourage to continue that kind of messaging, keeping those options open, and at whatever time frame a student is now thinking about college, celebrate that little moment, right? Regardless of deadlines, let them know that they are definitely able to still continue and connect them to whatever the resources they're thinking about. And the last piece that comes to my mind, uh, tax services and tax providers. We encourage you all to look into your communities who provides free tax services. Um, that's a big thing for our uh, immigrant community. Uh, we're not tax experts as well, but we do ask about taxes when financial aid comes in. So we encourage them to go to the resources in their community. So that's something that you want to look into. So you have those resources for yourself or for your financial aid team. Um, that would be a great first step to support students with that process. Thank you, Hugo. Lori, any Last parting words. Um, the question that I'm seeing coming in and the questions that I get most often from folks that support students are questions about eligibility and um, financial aid package and things like that. Um, and those questions really do, can't, they can't, the answers to those are nuanced um, and, and vary a, a bit from campus to campus across the participating um, colleges and universities that, that have co college core programs. So once your students are, in, uh, you know, identify their campus of interest, it's these f campuses are very communicative. Um, they love to hear from them. So encourage them to reach out or reach out on your behalf, um, to on their behalf to get answers to those questions. Um, I'm also happy to connect with folks as well. So feel free to share my contact information as liberally as you'd like. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. So we hope this information from babies to seniors to beyond was helpful and um, continue to spread the good word about the availability of financial aid and that 
parents too and families are not alone in this and we're all here to help and support them in um, their their children at least realizing that their children's dream of going to a higher education um, is a can be a reality for them so thank you all <laughs>